So, as I said, today we're going to focus on um, planning reading lessons. And before the webinars, we had sent the survey and uh, you had a chance to ask some questions. And there were many questions about reading because, as you know, uh, students respond to reading tasks differently. We live in a very digital culture, very visual culture, and everything is in pictures, you know. Um, our attention span, I believe, is like getting, you know, shorter and shorter. So, um, and we have more and more problems staying focused and reading. I, I'm talking about myself too, because um, reading books used to be easier for me. Now I still do it, but it takes a little bit more effort. And I believe the same happens to our students. And because they're young learners, they're already digital natives. They grew up in the digital world. So they're really fluent with technology. And sometimes staying focused for a longer time might be a challenge. And here we are, and that's our job, to keep challenging them, but also to make it a little bit easier. And on top of it, to make it meaningful for them, because after all, we are teachers and we're supposed to teach them the language, which might be done in an active way, but also we have to teach them these uh, passive skills like reading and, and listening. Now, in the previous session, let me get back to it just for a second. Um, um okay i'm sorry i just saw that some people have problems with the sound but i see that it works now okay cool so in the previous session we talked about this long-term lesson planning for those of you who weren't there we talked about planning a week two weeks or a unit ahead and one of the things that appeared in the previous session was uh, while planning a reading lesson uh, of course some things might go wrong and what usually goes wrong or what often goes wrong I mean not usually maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit um, but what might go wrong is that for example we don't have enough time enough time for reading uh, but this is just one of the problems there are other problems like my students don't want to read they're not enthusiastic or they struggle with understanding the text and so on and so forth so this is these are all the problems we're going to tackle today so let's move on to you know some detailed aspects of it so planning a reading lesson now I always believe that the very first thing we have to do when we plan the lesson, be it a reading lesson, listening lesson, I don't know, uh, grammar and vocab or vocab and, I don't know, speaking, whatever you plan, we always check our options first. And I really encourage you to do so because uh, with good course books, there are so many extra materials and there's so much you can use. And it really saves us a lot of time because I have mentioned that before, but I will keep repeating that. Um, there are some really wise people who spent a lot of time preparing our teacher's book, extra materials, and so on and so forth. Um, and I do like to use it because they're good and they save my time. I don't have to do it. Someone has done it for me and has done it well. So do check your options. Now, what I've chosen for today as a sample lesson is reading from uh, level three of Academy Stars. And it's not reading which is a part of a unit, but it's this bigger reading that you have uh, every couple of units. So it's reading time two, Sam and the number 22 bus. For those of you who teach with Academy Stars, are you familiar with the story? I picked this because it's my favorite ever. I love this story because I like buses, I like traveling. So, um, so I like this one a lot. Um, so yeah, for those of you who teach with Academy Stars, oh yeah, I see some of you love it too. Excellent. All right. It's a very, okay. I like to say cute lesson. I think the pictures are cute. The story is, is really funny. And my students, that's the most important thing because it's not about me, right? My students love the story and there's so much we can do about it. So we have these two pages in our book. Uh, quite a lot of text, as you can see. It's level three. So, you know, for level three, it's actually quite um quite a lot of reading and a lot of pictures and also when you look at the next page we have um this activity comprehension activity with a table which is also fun because there's coding here but we're going to talk about it a little bit later and there's also one more thing that i am not using today in my lesson but I do use it in my lessons, just normally I spread it into two lessons. But if you look closely, there's also the video. Now, um, the video, um, I'm sorry, let me stop for a second because I see that a lot of people have problems with the sound, but I see that some people hear me. I am not muted, so 
Yeah, it works perfectly. So probably trying another browser could be uh, a good way to go, right? Um, so there's also a video and the video is an animated story from the bus uh, about people on the bus and about going from one place to another. Now, the cool thing is that this story is different to this story. There are two different stories, so it's not like you have an animated version of the text. You have an extension here. You have another story which opens up so many other possibilities for us to work. Okay, so we have checked what we have. This is what we've got. We've got one more time the reading, which is recorded. We have the recording here. There is this icon. We can click uh, on it, and then um, there is a speaker who reads the text. And we have comprehension activities, and we also have the video. So as you can see, a lot of material. I don't have to prepare anything. Everything has been done for me. So the first thing, uh, the second thing, having checked my options, uh, the, th the second thing I do is I ask myself a question. So, okay, so I want to have a reading lesson. What is the primary aim of my reading lesson? Because if you think about it, there might be different aims that we have when it comes to reading lessons. And here are some examples. Um, you might want to have a reading lesson and focus on evoking general interest in reading. You want your students to read more because they'll need it later on. And, you know, in every serious exam, there is always some sort of reading, right? Um, also, you might want to focus on uh, teaching your students or practicing with your students, understanding the text in detail, which is also an exam skill. Uh, maybe you want them to uh, look critically at the text and, um, and you know, say what they like, what they don't, what is good, what is not about it. Maybe you want to talk about different genres, um, many options here. Or maybe you only use the reading to work on some vocab or maybe some grammar, maybe you want to take this vocab and turn it into your target language, and then you want to use it in your next lesson because you find this vocab interesting, or it goes well with some other things that you have planned or are planning to plan. Um, or maybe what you want to focus on is for your students to share opinion on the text. Now, um, this is something that I think is really, really, really important. It's extremely important because um, this is what our students will be asked to do later on. They have essays, they have opinion essays to write, and they do have to be able to share their opinion. So they do have to be able to, to understand the text, to think what they think about it, and also to be able to state it while still being respectful, right? So, as you can see, there are many, many aims. I mean, of course, when we do the reading task, we normally do all of these things, right? But I encourage you to choose your primary aim, because if we choose too much, then it might be a little bit chaotic. We might get a little bit overwhelmed. Our students might get overwhelmed. Now, if you choose your primary aim, this is what you focus on. And then I will show you how it works with, uh, with a lesson plan and with lesson stages. All right, so um, let's carry on. Uh, but before we do, um, let me just ask once again, because I see that still there are some problems with the video and sound that makes me very upset because I'd like all of you to be able to hear. Uh, so I think it really depends on the browser, doesn't it? Or maybe you can, you know, try to use another browser. I'm using Firefox and uh, it works. So um, I don't know, maybe if you use another... But I see that for some of you it's also, okay. So uh, we have established our primary aims. And now let's talk about the components of a good reading lesson. Because it's not enough, as you some of you know from the previous session, it's not enough to just open the book and say, okay, read the text and then we're gonna talk about it. We do have to stage the activities and we do have to do it step by step, approach it step by step, because it is a challenging task for our students. There's a long text, there's a lot of language, and we do have to take it step by step. So let me show you um, the steps that um, I normally take when I prepare a reading lesson. So uh, here you can see them. I always start with the context, setting the context. Now I'm talking about a lesson which is like just a reading lesson, okay? So this is like the whole lesson is about reading. It's not just a part of my lesson. So I also include some revision here and everything. So context, pre-reading, reading, comprehension, opinion slash follow-up. 
Now, let me walk you through these stages. And also, I would like to show you some examples of activities that you can do on each step. So it should give you the full picture of a good uh, reading lesson. So let's start with the context. Um, it's extremely important to set the context for every lesson. This is something that uh, makes our students safe, that organizes, helps them organize um, the, the newly acquired knowledge in their heads, but also makes them feel safe because they know what's going on, to put it simply. Um, so the benefits of setting a clear context is that it helps you students remember relevant vocabulary and grammar, because if our context, as you can see, in this lesson, our context is, you know, means of transportation, traveling, you know. Um, so I already know that may like because I can recall some past lessons, and I know that we have already mentioned, we have already talked a little bit about there was this lesson about uh, traveling by car, or you know, like really it depends on what materials you work on, but you can always go back and you can see these lessons. So. Uh, it helps our students also recall some vocabulary that they have learned before. Also, if you set the context well, this is a good moment to elicit some ideas before the reading, right? So before you even show the text, before the students start reading it, you can already work on it, right? Because the context is traveling, so we can, uh, traveling by bus, so we can start talking about it, maybe have a short conversation, maybe we can have a, a small game, I'm going to show you some games in the moment and it also helps your students create new what i call labels you can call them links whatever you want really people have different names for that but associate certain vocab with certain topics so in real life when they end up being on a bus they should recall the words that we have practiced with them in our lesson so once again this is our story that we're working on sam and the number 22 bus and uh, when I set the context, uh, there are many games I use. I very often use the game bank, which is uh, part of uh, the teacher's book. But I sometimes also use my favorite games that work fine with my students that are not always a part of the game bank. I wanted to show you something which is not the part of the game bank, just to inspire you, but just so you remember, in the game bank, in your teacher's book, you have so many ideas and you can just use all of them as, uh, as you wish. So what I do with this lesson is I play a little game because I want my students to feel that we'll be traveling by bus. So the game is very simple. The first student says their name, how they feel, and where they want to go. So I don't know if you can see, but I'm not only setting the not only am I setting the context here, but I'm also um, revising some vocabulary related to connected with uh, places around town, which was the focus of the previous unit. So it's also revision. You see, I put these things together. I revise and set the context um, at the same time. So the student says, "My name is Lily. I'm happy. I want to go to the cinema." And then the whole class says. Let's go to the cinema by bus and either woohoo or beep beep or whatever you want. Uh, but we just make a sound. And if we are in a physical classroom, we make a circle, like, you know, run in circles around the classroom or stay in pairs and pretend to be on a bus. And we move a lot. So a lot of TPR here, right? Total physical response, physical activities. And then we have the next student. Now, there's a rule. These things should not repeat. But if they do... You know, we're just warming up, so I'm not too strict about it. Um, because my main aim, my primary aim of this stage is just to set the context, right? So then, my name is John, I'm sleepy, I want to go to the swimming pool, maybe to warm up a little bit and, you know, to wake up. And the whole class says, let's go to the swimming pool by bus, woohoo! And you see, you see what I'm doing here, I'm drilling the structure, let's go there by bus, Right, so we have by bus and let's go there and places around town. So look how much language there's already here, right? And we have only just started. Um, right, and uh, the next student, let's say Mandy. She says, my name is Mandy. I am hungry. I want to go to the restaurant. So you see, sometimes what my students say make more, <laughs> makes more sense, like, 
I'm hungry, I want to go to the restaurant because I'm hungry. Sometimes it's not really connected. Like I want to go to the swimming pool because I'm sleepy. It doesn't matter. I'm just setting the context. I want my students to feel they're on the bus. So Mandy wants to go to the restaurant because she's hungry and the whole class goes. Let's go to the restaurant by bus. Woohoo. And um, as we continue, of course, it depends on the number of students you have in your class, but you can divide them in groups and you can ask them to do it in groups. Um, or if you have smaller groups, you can do it together or you can just, you know, do this activity of a couple of lessons and in every lesson there will be different students saying something. So, um, but as you can see, there is a lot of drilling and we are on the bus, which is exactly what I wanted because that's what my lesson is about. It's about being on a bus. But because I like to use different senses in my lesson, I also sometimes do this. Um, so I ask my students, okay, so when you're on the bus, what can you hear? And here you have some examples of what, of what um, normally my, of what my students normally say. Crying babies. They always hear crying babies. I hardly ever hear a crying baby on a bus, but they apparently do. Maybe they have more sensitive ears. So we make these sounds. We say, oh, a crying baby. Uh, and the whole class, you know, cries. Or maybe squeaky chairs, like, eh, 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 right? The chairs can make, the seats, sorry, the seats on the bus can make different sounds. Or maybe the ticket machine, right? Going like, beep, brr, or brr, brr. it depends on the city. They are different in Warsaw, different in Hamburg, I've noticed. Um, or maybe uh, they can hear some people with headphones listening to the music a little bit too loudly and they hear, t -t 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 -t, right? So we make these sounds and for stronger classes, or if we don't do it for the first time, you can combine this with this. And every time we say, let's go to the restaurant by bus, then everyone makes a different sound. And look, they, they, they feel they're on a the bus, they think they're on a the bus, they hear being on a bus. So that's great. I think it's uh, quite a strongly set context. And my students just love this game. So even when we don't talk about buses, they want to be on a bus. Uh, and of course, you can use different means of transportation. If you have a lesson or a set of lessons about traveling, in every lesson, you can go by plane, by car, by train, go to, 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 right? So, so many things you can do here. Okay. So we have already set the context of our lesson and it's pretty clear the kids are excited. They're on the bus, not in a classroom anymore. So now let's move on to pre-reading. Now, um, I believe that pre-reading is a step which is extremely important too, because it's not enough to set the context and then say, okay, so we're on the bus, so here's a text about uh, Sam, who's a bus driver, so now read it. We need to prepare our students um, and we can do it in various ways. Now, this is extremely important not to skip the stage because first of all, Pre-reading tasks are also these tasks which are, which are very often called pre-teaching vocab, right? So you have a look, exactly like some of you mentioned that in the chat window. So you have a look at the text and you can already spot some words that might be problematic and you know that you have to teach them before the lesson or at least before reading. So we're going to talk about long, uh, sort of long-term reading planning a little bit later. So I'm going to get back to this. Also, the pre-reading stage in which we might pre-teach some vocab, we might have a look at what's around the text and we might uh, discuss the text without, I mean, discuss some things related to the text that you know about because you're a teacher, you have read it, but your students don't know about yet. It uh, helps our students get ready to understand the text in detail because you already, in this stage, you give them a lot of ideas, you elicit a lot of ideas, you give them the tools they need to understand the text and without panicking. Because again, just opening the text and asking them to read it, um, that doesn't work. And uh, truth be told, actually I did it once. Um, and I hope I don't come out as a cruel person, but I did it with one group, a strong group, and I did it with a text which was not the part of the book, just a different text, just because I wanted to check how they respond to reading tasks without this context, without pre-reading. It was a nightmare. I did it to check it. I, it was purely scientific reasons, um, but it was a nightmare. They were so confused and they were not interested at all. And they were like, oh my God, this lesson is so boring. And I think they were right, right? So fortunately, they forgave me later. Um, 
so also the pre-reading stage is the stage in which our students can start guessing and predicting what's gonna happen in the text and they can do it by looking around it or by answering your questions for example so uh, let me show you one thing that i do with my students and somehow related to long-term planning which is um pre-teaching vocabulary now very often when we pre-teach vocabulary we do it in the same lesson which is fine, you can do it with maybe higher levels, you can give them a matching activity, right? If it's not your target language, you don't want to spend too much time on it. Um, what I do with my younger students, young learners, and we teach young learners, don't we? I prepare a list, I look at the text, and I prepare a list of words that I think are important. There are keywords or the words that I think are important for my students and can be useful in different units because soon we're going to be talking about summer activities and uh, maybe I need uh, my students to be able to distinguish between jump and jump off, you know, phrasal verbs, right? And um, we're going to be talking about rules, so I want them to know the word careful, patient, and so on and so forth. So I make a list of these words and I do it because I always plan ahead and I really strongly encourage you to do so. I make a list and um, I have this thing called a magic envelope. Sometimes it's a magic box, sometimes it's a secret word. It really depends, like you can use different names for that. And I have one, two, three, four, five words. I mean, four words and one pair of expressions, ground and top floor. So um, what I do is I take about three, four lessons, or maybe even the whole unit before my reading task. And I already teach them these words. At the end of the lesson, I go, oh, guys, by the way, before you go home, oh, I've almost forgotten. I have a surprise for you. I have a little present. It's a secret word. I think I have it in my pocket. And then I search for a secret word. And I say, I whisper it. You know, we can play Chinese whispers, for example. Or it's on a little piece of paper. And the students, when they leave the classroom, they have to repeat the word. That's our key word. And then they have to say the word when they enter the classroom the next lesson. They might not remember. So I rem so, so I help them. And Or you can ask them, the more words you teach, you can ask them, okay, so now what were these words? Do you remember all of them, all of the secret words? Sometimes you can hide these words around the classroom, you know, stick, like write them on, on small pieces of paper and just stick them somewhere, you know, under the desk or whatever and uh, have your students search for them. So... That helps me a lot because I already, when I, uh, when the moment comes for my teaching lessons, lesson, my students already know the vocabulary that they need to understand the text. So I don't need to pre-teach vocab because I've done it already, right? And I didn't do it like at one time because, look, like. It might be confusing, and I think you would agree with me, for those of you who are also actively learning languages, I'm sure we can give each other a high five. Learning a lot of words at the same time is just difficult. I'm going through this with German now, and it's really, it's a bit of a nightmare. Um, I don't want to serve it to my students. So um, they are already, you know, like because we, we take it step by step, they're not overwhelmed, and they can focus on using this vocab actively. If my main, my primary aim of the lesson is understanding the text, and if it's expressing opinion, then can use them to express opinions, and they can say, people on the bus are very kind, right? Uh, because they already know these words, or at least know them passively, even if they can't use them yet, they already understand them. It saves a lot of time in our reading lesson, and as you know, reading lessons can be quite, I mean, you know, some stages of it can be quite um time consuming uh, there is a question if i translate them uh, hardly ever hardly ever although i do believe that translation sometimes works because if it's not your target language if it's not my target language and the words are quite difficult then i might um but sometimes i turn these words into my target language and then i don't translate um especially like you know with ground floor top floor right when we play the bus we can say oh let's jump to the top floor and then we pretend to run upstairs right and so on so I do translate them sometimes, but hardly ever. Normally I don't. Um, okay, another thing that I do as a pre-reading task to, you know, we already are on about the context um, is, uh, is clearly set. We do know the vocab. We look at the pictures around uh, the reading on our page, in our page. There are always so many pictures. And in these pictures, there's so much going on. Um, and normally, these, I mean, always, <laughs> these pictures somehow show what's going on in the story. 
So my students look at the pictures and they say, and actually I'm going to ask you these questions. So where are these people going? And they are going to different places. Can you maybe try to guess where are they going? What are your ideas? There are many ideas here. So if you could write it in the chat window, I'd appreciate that. Mm. Shopping, excursion, school, yes. Uh-huh. Exactly. Some of them are going to work. Or maybe to a museum. They have photo cameras, so they are tourists, right? Um, yeah, maybe to the cinema. They might be going to the cinema on a date. Yeah, right? Or for a trip to a mall. You see? Look, so many places here. And so many, you see how it works with our imagination, right? Excellent. Thank you so much. And what things have they got with them? What have they got? What objects can you see? Um, they have books, bags. Exactly. Now, bag is um, one of the main characters of the story. You see, it already appears here. Pre-reading. Excellent. Phones, some food, cameras. Yeah. All right. Uh, what else have they got? A backpack. You see? So much revision here, by the way. Um, excellent. Thank you very much. And what do you think they're talking about? Some of them are talking. I can see three pairs of people talking. What are they talking about? Oh, life. <laughs> right? Uh, totally. Totally. Um, that's what I always do on a bus when I meet someone. We're like, oh, what's up? Yeah, life is tough. <laughs> right? Or maybe a wedding. Or maybe, maybe someone's getting married. Maybe family. Or maybe they just gossip. Yeah. Oh, the kids are definitely either gossiping or talking about school or something very exciting. Or maybe last weekend's birthday party. We don't know. Maybe they talk about the weather. People do talk about the weather especially nowadays when the weather is crazy all right excellent so you see how many ideas you already have here excellent and uh, how often do they take the bus because in unit three this lesson is after unit three in unit three we talked about you know sometimes never all these words um so the adverbs of frequency every day some of them probably every day uh school kids right they go to school every day what about these people with cameras yeah they are tourists so they probably only sometimes take this bus rarely or maybe just once right you see you already have an idea of what's going on in this very crazy bus and we haven't even opened the text yet right so thank you very much for your ideas they're excellent so I think we're clear that the context is set, the pre-reading task has been done, also pre-teaching vocabulary. Now, it's just an idea. You don't always have to do it. You can. It's just an idea here. Let's move on to oh, reading. And um, reading, uh, I mean, of course, <laughs> the purpose of reading is for the students to get to know the story. But there are also some other advantages of this stage. And something that is often omitted, but I think is really, really important, is that this moment when our students sit to read is this moment when the, the energy level drops a little bit. This is this moment when they can um, calm down, they can relax a little bit, and they can focus. Right. Because, you know, in our lessons, because we work with young learners, there's so much going on. We have these great games and so on. It is important to have these moments um, that are a little bit quieter. And as a teacher, I used to panic. I thought that quiet moments are not good because it means that my students are not having fun. So they don't like the lessons. And it took me some time to um, to realize that these quiet moments are really important. And I learned it the hard way when I was a student um, and I had a teacher who was very energetic. And I felt I was learning a language and I felt that I don't have enough time to digest what I've just learned. I don't have enough time to focus and to focus and, you know, like to take a deep breath. The energy level was so high all the time that I finished my lessons very stressed and I don't want my students to be stressed. So I want to control the pace of my lesson and reading. This is one of the, the greatest benefits of reading, uh, apart from all these, you know, other things like understanding the text and vocab and so on. And speaking about vocab and grammar, reading allows our students to see some grammar and vocab in context. That's why I never assign reading tasks um, as homework. I don't do it um, because I do believe that they should be done in lessons. You might disagree with me, 
but uh, because I want to have a lot of control over my students and how they approach it. I want to make sure that they see what I want them to see. And I'm sure that if I say, okay, read it at home, because you know I don't want to let's say spend this time in my lesson on reading because it's time consuming, I know they're not gonna pay attention to what I want them to learn from and what I want them to take from this text. And also another thing in this stage, we, I mean, our students, they get this immediate feedback on their predictions because in the previous stage, we were talking a lot about the people on the bus. My students read the text and they know already, right? And I'd like to take a short break here uh, just to mention one thing. Um, do you think that we should always play the recording? Because here, some of you asked about it. Some of you asked about playing recordings and whether we should do it, or maybe we should do it only with weaker groups to support them. Or maybe, I don't know, maybe we shouldn't do it at all. How do you feel? Right? Yeah, so I do believe we should do it. Um, I do believe it's very important for various reasons. One reason that, because one of you said, but now students learn online and they're at home. Yes, and that helps us control the reading time. Because in your classroom, even if you don't play the recording, because sometimes you don't want to, sometimes, I don't know, the equipment doesn't work, you know, things happen. Um, so, but we can still control our students. Now, in online lessons, this is the way to do it. I mean, of course, you don't have this full control, but that's the best we can do, right? So, um, I also believe that uh, playing recordings is really important because it helps students make these links between the written word and the, the sound of it. Now, as you know, in English, uh, pronunciation, or rather reading, and yeah, pronunciation, pronouncing some words and reading some words, it can be a challenge because there are so many words that look the same but are read differently because they have different origins and one is Greek and one is Latin and, and one is, I don't know, French. So this is really important, like this link between what I see, what I hear. So then they know how to pronounce words. So some of you mentioned pronunciation and I totally agree. Also, rhythm and intonation, which is very important. Um, if you come from a country in which your native language is Slavic, which I believe it's, it's most of us, um, as you know, in Slavic languages, we don't really, we, we are like, when we speak, I think, if, I mean, I don't speak all the languages that you speak, but I think like, at least in Polish, we sort of like take a deep breath and go like, Trrr. we don't really have the strong intonation. You do have it in English, right? So, um, and that's what I want my students to um, to remember, right? And also, if you do it, like, be it in your physical or online classroom, it dictates the pace of reading relevant to the level of our students. Not too fast, not too slow. Everyone can catch up. There is a lot of support for weaker students, a lot of also um, extra challenges for stronger students. Like, you know, stronger students would maybe catch the, you know, the, the links between pronunciation and uh, written word a little bit more right? Weaker students will understand the story because they get a lot of support. So stress and words, all the things you mentioned, right? So please do remember about it uh, when we do reading. It's not just read the story so we know the story. There's so much more going on there. And then if you maybe have a meeting with parents and your, and your parents, the parents of your, of your children, of your students say, well, why do they read so much in the lessons? These are your arguments. Well, they read a lot because A, B, C, D, right? So time to move on to comprehension. So um, comprehension questions and tasks. Uh, normally, uh, this is this controlled practice. We want to check if our students have understood the text. And uh, of course, you can uh, divide it into stages. First, you can check the, the understanding of the general idea of the text. Then you can move on to some detailed information. And I do encourage you to do so. Take it step by step. So first, the general idea. And then we get um, into um, then we get into details. And when it comes to the general idea, you actually have normally with every text, um, at least in uh, Academy Stars course, you have this question, right? Look, read the story. It's above the text. Read the story. What things do people leave on Sam's bus? What happened to Millie's bag? Okay, so my students, look, we in the pre-teaching, the uh, pre-reading stage, we have already um, checked what objects we can see on the bus, so it's already a little bit easier, right? And then what happened to Millie's bag? So they have to understand that uh, someone took, uh, an old lady took Millie's bag by accident. Okay, that's what they need to understand. And then you can move on to the comprehension task, which you have uh, also in the book. 
right? So, and it's cool. I love it because it's coding. So the students, they have to decode the sentences. So you have some drives the bus and so on and so forth. And there's also a possible extension to it. If you have stronger groups or if you have fast finishers and you want to keep them busy, uh, you can have them make their own coded sentences in pairs, in groups, individually. It's entirely up to you. Now, it's not going to be that easy here because you can see the verb forms. They also have to agree. So, um, but there are some possibilities. For example, 3C. So we have sometimes, 4C. Some, 4B, drives, 3B, the umbrellas, true or false? I mean, technically, if someone leaves an umbrella on a bus, they, he does drive the umbrellas, right? So, of course, you've got, like, you know, you can, um, you can laugh here, too. And um, uh, sometimes you have really funny sentences. Okay. Um, another thing that you can do as uh, to check understanding of the text is matching the characters from the story with the picture. Not all, of, not all of these people are mentioned in the story, but I'll show you something that is really, really cool. Which one, which person is Mrs. Blake? Now, Mrs. Blake is a lady who took Millie's bag by accident. Now, we have two pairs of ladies and... Both of them have bags. So how do I know which one is Mrs. Blake? And that's what I ask my students. And they have to read carefully to see that the text says, one day a young woman, Millie, was on the bus. Next to her was an old woman called Mrs. Blake. So we only, we know that Mrs. Blake is the, in front of the picture because we need an elderly woman and in the back there are two young women or like a woman and a teenager. And that's how we know, right? So they have to read this text carefully and if they can't guess at the first, because you know, um, they see the bag in the back also. So they, they might want to say, oh, this is Mr. Uh, Mrs. Blake. And they go, oh, really? I think I saw something different in the text. And you know, they refer back to the text and uh, go back to the text and, um, and they try to find the correct answer, right? It happened to me that none, none of my students knew the answer and they had to go back to the text. Normally someone does know the answer, um, but it's just one word. You see, you teach them to pay attention to keywords, by the way, which exams, right? So a win-win, I'd say. Okay, so we have set the context, we have done the pre-reading task, we have pre-taught the vocabulary, and my students are already emotionally on the bus, we have read the text, we have checked our students' understanding. Of course, when it comes to comprehension, you can ask questions, you can have a discussion, you can do voting, there's so much you can do, um, but just remember not to omit this step. Because finally, it takes us, after we have understood the text, or students have understood the text, it takes us to the last step, which is opinion and follow-up. Now, this is something that serves some sort of a closure to this reading lesson. That's why I think, and I strongly believe, it's really, really important because I want my students to understand that, like, to leave my lessons with this sense of fulfillment, right? That it's like wrapped in a in a bubble, <laughs> or, you know, like packed in a box, right? It's one product. So, um, I believe that opinion follow-up stage, so the last stage of a reading lesson is extremely important because, first of all, it wraps up the lesson, as I've said. It helps our student express and justify their opinion, right? We want them to respond emotionally to the text. We want them to like it. We want to, them to feel somehow connected so they can remember better. That's one of the reasons when you work with maybe a little bit older students or teenagers or young adults or adults, you, you know, when you teach them vocabulary, you want them to write some sentences, you always say, make them personal because you can remember personal things, right? So I, I find it extremely important. It helps our students use some language they've learned before because they can use this, this language that they have been pre-taught or they can talk about places around town and, you know, a student can say, I don't like the bus because it doesn't go to the cinema, right? Quite a complex sentence, but, you know, something like that. And it gives uh, me as a teacher, so it gives us an opportunity to work on some grammar and vocab because you might want to use your reading text to actually work on something else, right? I mean, in your reading lesson, your primary aim is one of the, the, the ones that I uh, showed you at the very beginning of the lesson, uh, of, oh, sorry, of the webinar, right? So I choose my primary aims, but uh, this doesn't have to be everything. 
because in the same lesson or in the next lesson, depending on how you plan it, we can use uh, this very long text to plan uh, to practice some vocab and grammar. Now, I never ask this question, how did you like the text? Because the reaction is that my students either suddenly, you know, shut off their cameras, right? Or they do this or they, you know, crawl under the desks because it's like this question, how was school? No one knows how to answer it, right? So what I do instead is one of my favorite ways of collecting my students' opinions. I say, okay, so open your book, go to unit one, two, or three. These are the units we have already discussed and find a picture in the book that best shows, best represents your opinion on the text. And here we have some examples. A student might be fascinated, like the girl in the upper left corner, or a student might be just happy, or like the monkey find the text very funny or exciting, or maybe it was an adventure, or maybe you see this, this boy in a blue sweater in the middle. The boy is a little bit confused. Maybe for some students, the text was a little bit difficult, right? This is also feedback that I get from my students, which helps me plan my further lessons. So, you know, so um, two things here. First of all, the students, it's a little bit easier for them because they recognize, instead of talking about their emotions, they just recognize emotions in pictures and show them. And then you can ask them questions. They feel a little bit safer. And secondly, you know what they do? They page the book, right? They go back to previous units. They might catch out of the corner of their eye. They might catch some nice words that they haven't used for a long time, right? So, um, yeah, and it is true that by students' faces, you can also see how they like the text, although I do encourage you to go a little bit further with that. And I do encourage you to, um, you know, just instead of just uh, guessing their feelings based on their body language, which you can, that's true, you can see it, I encourage you to make your students express it, all right? Because uh, that's what we want them to do in exams later on, maybe, right? Okay. So, um, as I said, this last stage, opinion and follow-up, it also gives an opportunity to work on some grammar and vocab from the text. And I'd like to stop here for a moment, and I'd like to show you how I do it. So we have this activity, this is this comprehension activity in which students, my students have to make uh, sentences, decode the sentences. But if you look at these words here in this box, the question that comes to my mind, what grammatical tense can I practice here? We have sometimes, we have like, drives, forget. What grammatical tense? Present simple, of course. Now, um, we have already, with my students, discussed present simple. If you look at the scope and sentence, um, these are the things we have done before. So we have present simple and present continuous. We're going to focus on present simple. And we also have adverbs of frequency. So always and um, oh, sometimes here, I think I... Did something wrong with the colors, I'm sorry for that. But we have adverbs of frequency. So um, what I do is I ask my students to make sentences and they can be correct or incorrect. Now for weaker groups, I make sentences, just put the numbers and letters randomly really, um, but it's always more fun when they can code. And then we have sentences like the one, three C, no, four C, three C, one B, three B, two A, which is some sometimes forget the umbrellas. And we have them, and then we can work on grammar. We can go, well, okay, there's something wrong with this sentence. And you elicit the correct form, some sometimes forgets the umbrellas, right? So you can work on some grammar here, and there's a lot of coding here, which like is mystery, so students love it. And, um, and um, you can work on error correction, which is a great activity for grammar, I believe. And also, another thing you can do is you can make another Board, uh, table here if you want to practice some more right uh, or you can ask your students to make uh, this could be a class project actually um, or simply uh, just one stage of the lesson so you can ask them to make their own tables where they put different words and maybe look here we've got past simple also forgot right careful never so we also have adverbs of frequency it really depends on what you want to practice but you can put any grammar you want here right? Just remember to keep the context. So use the same characters, right? So this becomes an extension of reading. Also, another thing you can do, um, in previous uh, units, we learned uh, to be in present simple, but also in past simple. 
So what I do, because it's so easy when you do it online, or if you have a screen in your classroom, but if you don't, you can use a plastic sleeve or you can uh, make a copy of the text and just use a marker to cover some words. And what I do is I cover to be. So look at the text and decide what the form of the verb to be is, all right? I use this moment to drink a sip of water. I'm sure you can see it, right? Because there'll be different forms here. Yeah, so there are different forms. So one day a young woman, Millie, this is the text, right? From our reading, hmm, on the bus. One day in the past, she was on a bus. Next to her was an old woman called Mrs. Blake. But so this is the past story. But then we have quotation marks and we have, oh, this was my stop. This is my stop, said Mrs. Blake, and so on and so forth. So as you can see, I only covered those uh, to be verbs that are that have a meaning. I did not cover auxiliary to be. So for example, at the end of the first paragraph, we have it's coming from my bag. I didn't cover it because my focus is present simple and past simple, not present continuous, right? So, uh, but that's my choice. You can cover everything. It's entirely up to you, depending on what you want to practice. And also one more thing you can do, if you want to use the reading text to practice some grammar and vocab, which I do very often. And uh, I, I just, think it, it works fine it works fine for me i don't have to provide extra materials because i have the book and i have everything uh you can use colors and color code some words cover them and then um give your students this table in which you say oh this piece of paper or write it on the board in which you say which color stands for what so sam johnson drives the number 22 bus in london it's a beautiful hmm, bus i need a color what was the color? Red. But you can put any color you want here. I tell my students to create new stories. Maybe it's a black bus or a white bus, or maybe it's a yellow bus, or maybe it's a colorful bus in a shape of a unicorn. You know, the sky's the limit here, really, right? And then uh, orange time expressions, grammar. Some people travel on his bus every day and they sometimes never always entirely up to your students, and so on and so forth. We also have, uh, for example, yeah, blue everyday object. Uh, people forget things on the bus, lots of, and here, trust me, your students will have great ideas and they will laugh a lot because they're definitely gonna say something silly, which I actually love because it makes me, it makes me laugh, I like silly. So um, I always praise their ideas, the crazier the better. Like I also had like a herd of sheep left on the bus, you know, <laughs> so because we were talking about farm animals and then, you know, um, so why not? And then um, food, they also leave some food so we can revise some food vocab, right? And also feelings, happy, sad, sleepy. So you create whole new stories and then students can exchange these stories. They can draw pictures, right? They can draw a picture of a new bar similar to the one they have in the book, right? But also remember, uh, yeah, of course, you can code. Uh, one of you asked if you can do it with verbs too. Of course, you can do it with verbs. Also, when you do uh, verbs, you can code uh, You can code present simple, past simple with different colors if you want to give your students more support. It's entirely up to you. You can code whatever you want. You can code articles if you're working on articles, right? Anything, the sky's the limit, depending on what grammar and vocab you want to take from this text. So how you want to extend your reading lesson. But as you remember, we had these goals, the primary goal of our reading lesson, right? And uh, depending on which thing you choose to be your primary goal, your primary aim of the lesson, you would focus on a different stage of it. And that's how they connect. So for example, if your primary aim is evoking general interest in reading, you would probably focus on the context stage slash pre-reading stage on these two, right? Because this is when you make students uh, excited about the reading. Um, but if you want to focus on understanding the text in detail, then you definitely should spend a little bit more time on pre-reading, reading, reading and comprehension questions, right? So maybe shorter context introduction, but instead of one comprehension task, two comprehension tasks, depending on what your primary um, aim is. Or if you want to focus on looking critically at the text, that would be expressing opinion. So you wouldn't work too much on vocab or grammar from the text, right? You don't want it now because from this text, what you want is to for your students to be able to express their opinion. 
And if you want to talk about the text, then follow up. They have expressed their opinion and we have some vocab and so on. And now let's talk about it. Let's talk about different means of transportation. Let's talk about what's cool uh, about being on the bus and what's maybe not so cool about being on the bus and so on, right? So it really depends on the aim you've chosen to be your primary aim. And uh, Natalia has also mentioned that we're going to talk about long-term planning for reading lessons. I have already talked a lot about the benefits of long-term planning in general in our previous session. What I mean here is that um, it's always worth looking at the scope and sequence. Because if you have a look at it, it's the very, you know, the first page of the book. You can see how many readings you're going to have in this, uh, in every unit, like over, let's say, four units here. So I can see what the readings are and I can see what the topics are. I can also see what grammar I have there. So then I know that with my sum and the 22, the number 22 bus, I can revise present simple past simple because I have, you know, taught it before. And you can also see where, like with what, with which part of other lessons this text connects. So we can use it for revision. So for example, at some point, um, the text is after unit three. In unit four, we have planning a North Pole adventure. We have to get there somehow, right? Maybe by bus, right? Or also there is a play, which is the outing. If it's the outing, we have to use means of transportation to get to the cinema theater or whatever we choose to go and so on, so forth, right? You see the grammar, so this is what helps you plan your reading uh, lesson, and this is what already, if you do it before, if you plan the whole unit ahead and think about the reading lesson long before it actually happens, like, I don't know, two weeks before, you can prepare to that. And then it might seem like a lot of work, it's not a lot of work, and it makes our reading lesson much more effective and therefore, I guess, easier and more rewarding for us, right? So also remember pre-teaching, I can only pre-teach these words long before the reading lesson because I have planned ahead. So I do encourage you to do it. What I also do is in let's say five lessons before the, the reading lesson and the context of the whole unit is you know traveling, means of transportation, places around town. I say, I took a bus to school today and I found an umbrella. The next lesson, I took a bus to school today and someone forgot their shopping bag. I'm already introducing the context. So, you know, like two weeks before the lesson that people leave things on the bus. Or I took a bus to school today and I left my lunchbox there, right? So you see what I'm doing here? I'm drilling another structure. I'm drilling past simple and I'm drilling this, I took a bus to school. And then remember our first activity in the bus lesson? Let's take a bus, uh, let's go to, no, let's take the bus to the swimming pool, I think, right? Or let's go to the swimming pool by bus. So take a bus, go by bus. You see these phrases are already so active in my students' minds. Sometimes I ask my students to like a week, maybe before the lesson, like three lessons before the lesson, uh, the lesson, right? To, if they take a bus to school, to draw a picture of who they can see on the bus and what objects these people have. Or if they don't take a bus, I, I say, okay, so you're walking down the street, look, like you can see people through the window. What do they look like? And what things have they got with them? And then, you know, our students, it becomes real because this is what they see in their books, but this is also what they see around them in real life. So I encourage you to do so. Now, this bus lesson is, of course, just an example, but uh, you can do it with every reading you do right, be it shopping mall or, I don't know, uh, park activities, right, anything really. And they can draw a bus driver, yeah, they can do it, right? Also, what you can do um, is, so the story is about number 22 bus that goes to uh, Westminster, Westminster, yeah. I uh, show my students the map because it's real, right? And I use Google Street View to play a small game. Let's walk around Westminster, which is where the bus goes. We use Google Street View or any other map that has this street view like um and we walk around and we try to find a bus because the like at some point you will find a bus in the streets let's look for a red bus and then my students have to tell me like a virtual trip they have to tell me go left go right please let's go straight ahead depending on what you want to practice usually i just go with go left please go right please turn left please please turn right please until we find a bus and if you take the map of london you will find a bus in like three four steps for sure and um, long-term lesson planning, it's, I really, especially when it comes to reading lessons, but not only, 
I do believe it's really, once again, I'm going to repeat it, extremely crucial because you can pre-teach the vocab long before the lesson. So let's sum it up, right? Let's repeat. You can drill some useful phrases, as you have seen, before, like from the reading even, right? You can take some phrases you want your students to know from the reading. There were some nice phrases there. And, uh, for example, have a good day or something like that. And you can drill them. So the students are already familiar with them. Um, you can inspire your students to observe their surroundings and to notice some similarities between what they see in the book, what they see in the real world, so they understand that it's the same thing, really, right? And um, also, um, you can see, if you plan before, you can see how the text connects with other units or other lessons in the same unit, and that also helps you plan the lesson. So to sum up very quickly, what I want you to remember is, first, always check your options. Always check what you've got. Look, I have prepared the whole lesson and I still have a video I haven't used, right? Which I can do in the next lesson or ask my students to watch it at home. Why not? It could be a nice homework assignment. Remember to choose your primary aims. Remember about the staging. Don't omit these, um, yeah, don't omit, uh, omit these stages. You can devote more time to some stages if you choose, uh, I don't know, comprehension to be your primary uh, aim, or if you choose opinion to be your finally to be your primary aim. But don't omit the rest. Keep them. Just make them shorter. Spend less time on it. Spend more time on your primary aim. But do all of it so it's well organized, well structured, and therefore effective. And also always look at the scope and sentence, and always uh, plan ahead. This is what I really want you to remember. And um, <clears throat> uh, I also want to tell you that there is a small surprise. After this session, you will receive a handout, a handout in which you have a sample lesson plan with this very lesson, uh, planned with the timing, with some comments, and so on. Now, in the lesson plan, of course, there are no, you won't find all the things we talked about here because that would be too much for a one 45-minute long lesson. But you will find one way of dealing with this lesson step by step with explanations. So I encourage you to have a look at it. Maybe it will be helpful for you. Maybe it will be inspiring. And also, I wanted to remind you that this is the second webinar, but the series consists of four webinars. We have two more to go. And in the next one, uh, I will be talking about maximizing fluency. So we're going to be talking about dialogues, fluency, how to use them. And then there will be another webinar about emergency situation and having a plan B, which, as you know, can be really useful too. So thank you very much for attending the session. I hope you enjoyed it. But not only did you enjoy it, but also I really hope that you found these ideas useful and they will make your life a little bit easier and they will inspire you to make even greater, to prepare even greater activities. Do remember that you also have the teacher's book where you have great ideas and do look there. I did talk a lot about how to work with a teacher's book in the previous session. So today I wanted to show you something slightly different, but that doesn't mean that you cannot go with the, the um, teacher's book because this lesson is also there. You can take my plan, you can compare it to the teacher's book, see which one you like more and uh, all combine both together. So thank you very much. And I'm wishing you a lovely weekend. As you can see, it got really sunny here. So I hope... Oh, yeah, sorry for that. It got really sunny here, so I'm definitely going to go for a walk now. I encourage you to do the same. And uh, I'm hoping to see you in uh, the next webinar in uh, on um, the 9th, I think, of April, as far as I remember. In April, right? The 9th of April. Uh, yes, Friday. So in three weeks. So thank you very much. And that would be it for me. Also, thank you for sharing your ideas. Thank you.